This presentation is brought to you by the West Virginia Behavior Mental Health Technical Assistance Center. The Behavior and Mental Health Technical Assistance Center is made possible through a collaboration between the West Virginia Autism Training Center at Marshall University and the West Virginia Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Student Support. The following presentation titled Leading in Challenging Times, Supporting Staff and Students During Reentry was recorded on July 8, 2020. The presenter was Dr. Jim Harris, Associate Director of the West Virginia Autism Training Center at Marshall University. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, like I said, we get, we're quick on time, but I want to make sure that we go through some of this content. Um, my name is Jim Harris. I'm the Associate Director of the Autism Training Center at Marshall University. I am, uh, you know, we at Marshall University, we have a variety of programs in the Autism Training Center. Uh, we're housed there and, and we're a state funded agency. One of the things um, that I feel like to the department that I'm going to represent today that we have, we have three distinct departments at the Autism Training Center. We have our college program, which is a program for degree seeking students at Marsh University with the clinical diagnosis of autism. So we all of our students this year will have 57 students coming into our program in our college program, which will, they're all uh, admitted students to Marshall. They meet the requirements of any other Marshall freshman and uh, or any other Marshall student for that matter. And they all have a clinical diagnosis of autism. Uh, we're very unique and, and we were the first in the country to have such a program. And what we provide is the, the supports that uh, those students need that relate to their diagnosis of autism around things like executive functioning, social skills, um, and things of that matter. The, the second program, which is probably is our oldest program, is our direct service program. And that program is specifically for um, families and individuals with autism. We provide everything from, uh, you know, uh, everything from ID cards to community based training to um, uh, online coaching, phone based coaching to uh, intensive in individual supports, uh, supporting schools. I know we've worked with Hardy County in the past as well. Today, the the the. The part that I'm representing uh, specifically is our uh, West Virginia Behavior and Mental Health Technical Assistance Center. The Behavior and Mental Health Technical Assistance Center is a collaboration between us at the Autism Training Center and the Department of Education's Office of Special Education. In that department, we have three distinct projects. We have our school-wide positive behavior support project, which is headed up by Alicia Zeman. We have our early childhood positive behavior support project, which is headed by Dr. Amy Carlson. And we have our mental health first aid project, which is set up by Diana Bailey Miller. So um, today, my my charge or my uh, responsibility in representing our technical assistance center is to talk about because uh, I know you're all administrators either at the county or building level. Is how do we lead during this time of reentry? How do we help folks with this time of reentry? Such a you know a lot of times when Jennifer and Shane first approached me about doing this talk. It was uh, after I had spoke to all the superintendents in, in Bridgeport in January. And at that time, we were talking a lot about discipline, culture, uh, belief systems about behavior and those kinds of things. So that was kind of the plan of, that the conversation that we would have today way back. And of course, since January, lots uh, transpired. So now, you know, it would be ridiculous of me to ignore um, the task at hand. So, uh, you know, not that I'm not that I think that uh, the behavior support systems aren't essential or mindset isn't essential. Um, and that conversation I have around things like reducing antisocial discipline strategies like suspension and detention and things like that, I still believe those things to the highest degree. However, I do know that there's some things right in front of us um, that we've got to focus on in order to, uh, to help support kids and, and staff uh, to help folks be ready to return to the educational setting. Um, I know different counties are doing different things. Um, I did the con I did this. Uh, I had a conversation with Mon County's administrators yesterday, and of course with you guys today, and and have several others in the future to talk about how to lead during this time of reentry. Now, let me be very clear: um, I'm not. Uh, I cannot consider myself an expert on something that's never happened before. Um, none of us are experts on this because it's never happened before. We can only borrow from what we know about psychology. We can only borrow from what we know about education and and, and leadership. And, and similar situations in the past. And it's really quite difficult to even find something that we would even call similar uh, to this in the past. So what I'm going to do is share uh, uh, my thoughts and, and, and what I uh, am processing right now as it, uh, as it relates to reentry 
and the things we know about how humans behave and how uh, folks feel safe in difficult times and productive in difficult times. So the first thing I think is important to consider is that stress and traumatized brains function differently. You know, and I, I know we know this, but we're not going back into business as usual because the physiology and the psychology of folks is different. Um, uh, we're dealing with people in a different psychological and physiological state. So the first thing we have to do is understand that state better. And if we understand the state better, then we can understand what strategies might be more effective and what things might be our priorities. So, you know, in looking at what disrupts our state, you know, back we go back to freshman biology and we learn about homeostasis. You know, stress itself by, by, you know, stealing from somebody much smarter than me, Robert Sapolsky out of Stanford, who's probably one of the leading experts in stress study uh, in humans and actually in a lot of animals as well. And he, he refers to stress as anything, a stressor is anything that disrupts homeostasis. Now, again, freshman biology, we know homeostasis is equilibrium or level. And uh, so stressor is anything that disrupts the level or disrupts the equilibrium. Now, that could be something positive or that could be something negative. And when we look at what is negative, uh, a common uh, elements of, of a negative by, by Medina's definition is, does it cause a physiological response? Is it perceived as aversive? And do, is there what how does the per, does the person not feel like they have control? So these three things are critically important when we evaluate a stressor. You know, um, you know, you look at a, a low level stressor, like for example, a treadmill. A treadmill is uh, it does cause a physiological response. It can be perceived as aversive, of course. That's why we cover them up with clothes and hide them from ourselves, right? Then we feel control. Yes, you have 100% control over whether you get on it, how fast it goes, that kind of thing. So a treadmill in and of itself is a low-level stressor because you'll find what the biggest factor in, in stressors comes down to, one of the biggest elements you want to always evaluate is the perceived level of control. It, and, and I use the word perceived on, on purpose because perceived is important because it's really the interpretation of the stressor as opposed to um, the actual control. Sometimes in a therapeutic relationship or in teaching or whatever, we're trying to help a student or a staff or a patient understand that they have more control over a stressor than they might realize. Um, but but this is one of the things we start to measure. Now, if we look at a very specific, a, a clear negative stressor, a child who's being, uh, let's say a child who's in a, a home where there's physical abuse, it does cause a physiological response. It is perceived as aversive and the child does not have control. So that stressor, is at such a high degree because of the elements, those three elements, and as those three elements come together. Now, how does COVID-19 fit into this? Um, very easily. It's very easily identified as a stressor because it does cause a physiological response. It is perceived as aversive, and, and we feel little to no control. Now, there's control behaviors that we're using right now, hand washing, mask wearing, social distancing. Those things are all things that are control behaviors. But there's so many things outside of our control, for example, decisions by government on things were opened or closed, um, you know, uh, who you can and can't see, uh, travel, these kinds of things that are impacting um, our, the level of distress. And it's clearly, clearly uh, disrupted our equilibrium. It's clearly disrupted our quote unquote normal. Everybody keeps talking about this new normal. Now, the problem with the new normal is it's not it doesn't hold still long enough for us to level out. And it's, it's also uh, disorienting that, that it's this stressor has our brains and bodies in a completely different, not completely, but a different state. So that's one of the things that, that kind of sets the stage for this. Now, one of the questions I've had people ask me is, um, has COVID, is COVID-19, is it a trauma? Is it traumatic? It's, that's tricky. And here's why it's tricky is because trauma is individually specific. Now, you know, even going back to when they first started studying, when they first called it, uh, soldier's heart and then shell shock and now post-traumatic stress. Um, what was unique about trauma is you'd have the same group of people, like say you have 20 soldiers go into a battle situation, but only five would come out with post-traumatic stress syndrome or sy symptoms. And, and the problem with that was, well, if trauma is trauma, then everybody should uh, have the same response physiologically and psychologically to it. And that we, we just learned that that's not the case, that there's other things that come into play, genetics, prior experience, things like that. But the most basic definition that we use for trauma is these exceptional experiences which are powerful and dangerous, which overwhelm the person's capacity to cope for whatever reasons of their level of coping being what they are. So the, way, the easy or not easy way, but a classic way to describe, for example, a traumatic event is one. Uh, I'll give you an example, one that I was uh, I experienced. Um, 
which is when I was asked to go and, and meet with a young lady uh, who was 14 at the time uh, to tell her that her father had completed suicide. In that moment, it was clear that that's a traumatic event. Why? Think of it this way. Tra- your, your brain, and I'll talk about it being a pattern seeking device in just a second, uh, it kind of drives down this road of an expected life. And that expected life is based on past experiences and observations about future experiences. So uh, your brain is driving down this road of the expected life. And, uh, and let's take this young lady's life, for example. Her father had been there his whole life. Um, he, he wasn't somebody who was hospitalized or had chronic mental health issues. He was what we call dysthymic, which means he had like a, a kind of a low level constant depression, had a lot of self angst, those kinds of things. And also had some medical issues that, that might have contributed to the completion of his suicide. But so in her life, though, her dad had been there, her parents had been together and she's driving down this road of expected pattern. And she and even if she looks forward and she sees <clears throat> other family members, other friends, other people in society, media projecting that um, generally speaking, fathers are going to be in your life as you get older. They're going to go take they're going to be there to take pictures for prom they're going to be there when you get married and be there when your kids are born. But in this moment, this traumatic event, the way I think about a traumatic event is this violent collision she had with the new reality. So her car is driving down the, the, the road of the expected life and then collides with this tree of trauma or this, this, this object of trauma or this experience of trauma. And that thrusts her into a whole different road, onto a whole different road or a whole different reality, a reality that she doesn't know how to exist within, a reality in which her father does not exist. And now she's lost and she's scared and she's confused because she has no idea how to drive down this new road. And a lot of times in therapy, what we're trying to do is to help people <clears throat> navigate the new road, um, help people to uh, understand how to exist in this new reality that now they've been thrust into. So that's clearly traumatic because of the violent shift in reality and the psychological and physiological uh, uh, trauma or disruption that 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 creates um, on a lighter note, but 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 also traumatic, for example, a friend of mine, this, if we relate to COVID-19, a friend of mine has a son who ever since he's been a freshman has been lifting weights and going to baseball and working hard on all this stuff to in order because he wanted to play college baseball. He's ended up being one of the better baseball players in our area. Um, but our area is small and, you know, we don't get, we don't, we're not a D one factory of baseball, but he would have had, he's had, he has a shot to play D two or D three potentially. And, and, but now he was a senior coming up to this year. He'd worked so hard. He was looking forward to having this senior year at the expected life. Remember he was projecting based on past, past experience and projections of other people's lives. that He would probably be playing baseball, um, in the spring and then COVID comes, uh, violent collision with new reality, thrust him into a new reality. And so that was traumatic for him. Now, I'm not trying to compare a parent completing suicide to a child, of, to a young person that can play baseball as trauma is trauma. There are varying degrees within it, but it's, it's, it's that individual experience that trauma creates. So with that being said, I can't say that, tra- that, that COVID-19 has been traumatic for everybody because I don't think it's been as violent a collision for, for everybody in the same way. Um, you know, I use myself as an example. I mean, I, I work at Marshall University. I'm fortunate that I've been able to uh, remote or uh, commute, telecommute. Uh, my wife's a principal of a local elementary school. Um, she's, able, she's been able to go to meetings and things like that. My boys are 13 and 10. We've been able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, maintain uh, child care for them. Um, and, and financially, our jobs continue to pay our paychecks. So, um, I, it, it would be dramatic and inappropriate for me to say that COVID-19 has been traumatic for me now. What we can say, though, is that this uh, that there's another element. Bruce Perry calls it big T and little t. Big T is traumatic. Little t is toxic stress. Now, it's clear that there have been families that had the traumatic experiences because of the financial impact and those kinds of things. But toxic stress is this lesser degree, which is um, a lot of times I refer to it as an exhausting life. Now, a more extreme ex- example of this would be that student uh, that you have in your school who uh, has food insecurity, who doesn't know who's going to pick them up from school, who stays with grandma one day a week, dad another day a week, uh, mom another day of the week. And it's all just based on who might be in the best psychological state. So it's not necessarily that they're being abused or traumatized. It's just that their life is exhausting because there's no chance to recover. There's no rest. Um, so one of the things I will say is that it does seem that, that, that the stress alone 
of this uh, that, that folks probably that haven't experienced trauma as a result of COVID-19 have clearly uh, would likely have experienced some level of toxic stress where they can't just seem to get reprieve from uh, the things that have going on, gone on. So the product we do know that is a result of, of toxic stress and trauma is a common response of anxiety. And what is anxiety? Anxiety is fear of the unknown. So anxiety is, I'm not certain what's going to happen. And the reason why anxiety comes about is because our brain's a pattern-seeking device. And, and, and what that means is at an early age, the way the brain learns, all learning for that matter, is pattern recognition. You take that two-year-old who's sitting in their high chair and they take the sippy cup and they drop it off the counter and they look at you. If you've had a two-year-old, you know what this is like. And you go over, you pick up their sippy cup and put it back on their table, on the table. And then they wait till you go back and sit down and you take a bite of food. And then they take the sippy cup and they drop it again and they look at you. And of course, you come back over, you put it back up and put it on the, on the table. So what they're doing is they're pattern testing. They're trying to solve the, the riddle or, uh, or the experiment of the sippy cup, which is when I drop this, what's going to happen? So when they get a, a pattern, then that pattern, that A plus B equals C, then gives them a sense of security in the environment because they, they have, they're getting a map of the world or can, quote unquote, predict the future. When I drop my cup, this is what's going to happen. So that's salt. Now, if you talk about a situation where that's not the same, would be you've got a kid uh, who drops her sippy cup once and the adult comes over and picks it up. They drop it again and because the adult's unstable, whatever it might be, get the adult picks it up, throws it in the sink and yells at them for dropping their sippy cup and get, uh, transmits all kinds of insecurity and instability and aggression. So now that kid's anxious. Why? Because fear of the unknown. I have anxiety because I don't know what's going to happen when this happens. And that just creates this general insecurity, this general disruption, and is exhausting to the brain. And that's when we start moving toward this idea of regulatory fatigue. Now, how this relates to what reentry is, I'm going to get to in just a second, because I have to set the stage in order to make, make us all understand that. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting ready to walk into a, a very different neurological and physiological situation and not just even the transmission of COVID-19, but the, the, the overall neurological load that the return to work, return to school um, is going to bring. So regulatory fatigue is really just about when you are uh, when your body is just done trying to manage all the stimulus of the world. Now, we know with things like autism, ADHD and things like that, they're much more um, so, uh, likely to experience regulatory fatigue because of sensory issues and things like that. People with anxiety are more likely to have regulatory fatigue. But I think we've all probably experienced some level of regulatory fatigue um, as a result of COVID-19. This is just to kind of make it more personal for you. Um, I know for me, uh, just being, uh, there's been so many of my patterns that have been disrupted and pattern disruption equals anxiety. So like going to the store, like I'm pretty competent at going to the store. I felt pretty comfortable. I know where things are. I know how to get things, how to get in and out. I know the rules. I know the, the, um, I know the curriculum and the hidden curriculum, I would say, of, of, of going to the store. Now, the problem is, is now there's this whole new dynamic of being at the store. There's wearing masks. There's social distancing. There's worrying about who's touching what. And there's worrying about how to move through a crowded aisle. There's worried about how do you get in line with your car to not crowd people? And then there's the other side of it, which isn't even just about yourself, but it's about other people. It's how to present yourself as a, a socially conscious shopper and not look like a, a reckless human being spreading COVID rampantly across Kroger. Um, so there's that social anxiety that comes with that, too. So going to the store now is a physiologically and psychologically more demanding experience than it was prior. Uh, things like washing your hands more often, where before you may have washed your hands. And it, it was just a good hygiene thing. But now you're washing your hands because it is such a critical health behavior. Another thing, too, that, I've you know, even just the change in environment triggers anxiety pattern disruption. Like, for example, the plexiglass shields that you see and a lot of times are going to be in schools now and be all over campus at Marshall, too. Um, the plexiglass shield in and of itself uh, uh, communicates anxiety. And, uh, you know, I'll, example I'll give from pre-COVID, um, I was in a, a rough area, I won't say where, um, in the country, and I stopped to get gas on my way home, and I knew I was in a rough part of that state, there's that town, but when I went in, um, the, the cash registers were behind plexiglass, and the way you paid was you pulled a drawer out, put the money in, and pushed the drawer in, and I just remember, like, the unsettling feeling, because all I wanted to do was just to get some snacks, to get on the road and get some gas, um, the unsettling feeling of, wow, 
this clearly is a dangerous place if they go to this length to protect the people behind the cash register. Same thing, not well, not same thing. A similar thing comes into the fact when you go to Kroger or you go to wherever and there's plexiglass, it is a reminder of danger. A re- and 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 because sickness is danger. It's a reminder, a reminder of danger. So that's the state that we're kind of living in right now. Um, that's the state that we're whether people believe it's real, fake, whatever. That but, but it's it's those things do impact your psychology. They disrupt your pattern. Now, the problem is, is when we experience high levels of trauma, high levels of toxic stress, either or, or both, or just anxiety, period, um, we can enter into this state of learned helplessness, which is, doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't change the outcome. You know, this is Robert, uh, actually, uh, oh, Seligman. Uh, Seligman was the one who coined the term learned helplessness. And one of the things that's so important about learned helplessness is it's when you try your strategies for addressing the future or challenges in the future and the strategies don't work. So I think I know what's going to happen. I do a certain behavior. It doesn't work. I think I know what's going to happen. It does. I do a certain behavior. It doesn't work. And then what happens is I start to lose faith in my ability to affect my world, to, to have outcomes. So that these are, this is kind of the foundation of understanding psychologically and physiologically um, the nature of our own minds, the minds of the staff that you're going to be supporting, and the minds of the students that you're going to be supporting. So let's get right into some strategies. I've got a, a little less than, a little more than a half hour, so I want to get into some more strategies. I want to leave a little bit of time at the end and maybe ask some questions, but then I know we're probably going to have a follow-up meeting to, to uh, you know, I'm happy, like I said, I'm happy to participate in a follow-up meeting to address things more specifically. So first thing I want to talk about is what not to do. And that, it's just a good place to start. The first place of what not to do is dismissing the need to process. Your staff and your students are going to need to process. Now, why? Because uh, processing serves a, a useful function of helping us organize the world again. We've got this new reality. One of the things we do with new reality, just like I mentioned with the young lady who, who lost her father, um, therapy for her is map making. It's I have to get I have to remake my map of the world in order to give me a sense of comfort to predict how to navigate or to understand how I might navigate the world. So now we have adults and students who are now in a new world. They've not been back to school since March. They're getting ready to go back to school. A lot of counties I've noticed are electing to uh, go, um, uh, if not full. I mean, every county I've talked to so far, which isn't a ton, and I won't go into too many details, but every county I've talked to so far are going back uh, uh, five days. Um, so now there's this new reality. No one has been at school with COVID the way it is. So what folks probably need, and this is the challenge. So you, you, you need, we need to give folks the opportunity to process. We need to give folks the opportunity to explore. But here's the thing that makes me nervous. It's processing, but not uh, admiring our problems or wallering. That's a hillbillyism, I know, but wallering in the problem, so to speak. You know, we're really cautious. I'll talk a lot about in meetings is when are we just admiring problems and when are we processing problems to move towards solutions? So if uh, I give you exa- uh, an outside example, like if I go to a behavior plan meeting and um, and all they're talking about is, you know, well, I know his uncle and I know his grandpa and, you know, this family and blah, 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 blah. And people spend 45 minutes of an hour long meeting talking about this kid's family tree and how everybody knows everybody and the sheriff's bill was out at their house and all that kind of stuff. That's admiring problems, not solving problems because no one's talking about what we're going to do different when the kids walk through the door the next day. Cause that stuff, although being relevant for context is not relevant for strategies. When we start talking about what are we going to do different? And oftentimes what happens is when we're admiring problems, we're spending a lot of time talking about things we don't have any control over as opposed to, Solving problems is like, now what? Now what are we going to do? What's next for us? So I think as administrators, you're going to have a tough time. It's a nice, what we call it the Goldilocks principle, which is the just right. You're going to have a tough time with um, processing versus uh, admiring the problem. And always the way you're going to be working on that, I'll give you some more ideas later, is going to be focusing on what you have control over and always working towards solution solutions uh, and, and trying to get rid of that just commiserating uh, for, for too long. So we'll talk about that more in, in the future. The one mistake, I've, and I've talked to a lot of educators um, and a colleague of mine him, from Kent State, him and I are doing some interviews with uh, some teachers to see about their uh, uh, experience with COVID and the response that it's had on them physically, emotionally, psychologically, and, um, and in their instruction. And one of the things I, I hear from teachers a lot is an anxiety about the, the students have fallen so far behind. 
So I want to, I want to be cautious that we don't fall into, and I made this up sometimes because it just helps me to organize things like this is I call it the cake mistake. So what the cake mistake is, is trying to make up for lost time. And so let's say, for example, if you have a cake that takes uh, to be cooked at 325 degrees for 40 minutes and you're running late, we all know that you can't put that cake on for 650 for 20 minutes because you burned a cake up. So my fear is, is that people will have this anxiety about uh, students being behind. They're going to try to make up for lost time. So they're going to increase the temperature in a decreased time frame in a, in a psychology and a physiology that's already overwhelmed and running high on, uh, with uh, regulatory fatigue problems. So I, I just really caution building leaders as you know, building leaders as you're the curriculum leaders that you're building um, to, to really be communicating on the needs for current needs assessment of students. And, and being real thoughtful about first things first, being real thoughtful about how the curriculum can be approached because we're, you're not gonna get um, the three, four months back that you missed. You're just not. And, and you know, maybe I'm wrong, but um, I, I venture to say I'm probably not on this one. Um, it, you know, we had a lot of schools that had a variety of different um, approaches to the to whenever COVID hit. You know, some people just did packets. Some people did online stuff like uh, apps and web based stuff. Some people did online instruction. But I, I, I would be hard pressed to find a county that would say, no, no, no. We, we had zero loss in academic instruction. We had zero loss in student gain. I just I just find that terribly hard to believe. So we know everybody fell behind. We know students have fallen behind. But please be careful not to just try to turn up the temperature and decrease the time. Another mistake I want people to be thoughtful of is too much of a good thing is still too much. I, I felt this way about when things came out and there was a, like a thousand different webinars and, and, and resource guides and all that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the fact that people created those. I think that was fantastic. But what we just started to find is even our staff internally at the ATC is, man, people are just overwhelmed by all the webinars and all the tools and all the websites. Uh, it was just a point of saturation. So I'm real, I want you to be real cautious of not trying to um, do too much. You know, we're going to talk about first things first. We're going to talk about teaming. We're going to talk about um, uh, behavior supports and teaching systems. We're going to talk about feedback systems. We're going to talk about relationship building. I think you've got to have your first things first. And as leaders, you've got to really keep your team focused on priorities because if not, people are going to drown. You can drown in help. Um, you can absolutely drown in help. So uh, then the reason why I have this picture of Vince Lombardi, Vince Lombardi was uh, uh, he won multiple Super Bowl championships. The whole Super Bowl trophy is named after him. That, that's pretty good credit. Um, and he had this one play called the Lombardi Sweep. And um, he ran it so well that he, he, he said he could uh, win, you know, most of his offense was based off that one play because they ran that one play so well and they could adjust that one play so much that they could win a lot of games because of how it was simple, but it was complex in its simplicity, if that makes any sense. So that's what we really want people to focus on is less is more. Too much of a good thing is still too much as we kind of move forward. Another one, this is going to be tough, and I, I can't – I can't tell you that I know how to solve this one, but I can tell you it is something that we need to be talking about before it happens with your staff and maybe even some of your experience in this yourself um, is fighting in front of the kids. Um, you know, I, I just know, I just know that there's a, there's a good chance you're going to have somebody in a building uh, that could potentially be in front of a group of students saying, oh, we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be here. This is dangerous. Uh, central office or whatever. Uh, and, and here's the thing. Here's what I want you to say. Now, just like in a marriage, uh, there may be times when you need to fight, argue, dis disagree, however you want to phrase it. Um, but you never fight in front of the kids because what it does to the kid, because if we're thinking about what's best for kids, what I do know is what's not best for kids is people who are already potentially have been traumatized, who already have experienced toxic stress, who have high levels of anxiety. The last thing they need is for the people that are charged to protect them to be fighting with one another. Because all that does is, is pose the question of, can they protect me? If they're if they're a danger to each other, danger even being emotionally, if they're a danger to each other, then they can't protect me. And it's it's you know learning how to, and it's like it's almost like that divorced family where the the mom or the dad complains about the other in the car, and all that does is weaken the child support system. So I'm not telling folks that you have to be like, you know, company line all the time kind of thing. And that you can never say you disagree, but it does no good to, for students to disagree in front of students. 
And I think as a leader, in, in my mind, um, this is something you want to bring up before it comes up. And if you have, and I know some of you in your buildings know there's certain teachers you're going to have more trouble with than others that are going to be more disruptive about this, more vocal about this. Um, you know, it may not be comfortable, but it's going to be thoughtful to approach folks early, small groups of people, talk to people early. And one of the, the, the things that's tough is, you know, the way a lot of calendars are set up, heck, you're only going to see teachers, you know, max like four or five days before the, the, the school year starts, which is going to be completely overwhelming to get folks ready because it doesn't give the adults a ton of time to process in a thoughtful way either. But I hope that there's going to be more opportunities for folks to collaborate before those standard calendar days, because I do believe that's what's going to be better for kids. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff that interferes with that, with, you know, contract days and unions and things like that. But I think the longer we can process and plan, the better we're going to be prepared to support and protect kids. Uh, the last the last uh, thing I'll mention, too, is trying to hire or purchase your way out of inefficient systems. Now, I do think it's important that counties look at what support systems they can create and to support. But I do think what we're going to see, and this is one of the things I talk about, is pressure on the lines. Um, the buildings that struggled with leadership before will struggle more. Um, you know, the buildings that had, you know, the teachers that struggled before with classroom management, teaching systems are going to struggle more. Um, I think if I'm a county level leader, I'm going to look at which of my schools are stronger than others. I'm going to look at which schools, you know, and I'll talk a little bit later. I, I'm biased, but I tend to believe a strong positive behavior support school, a strong school-wide PBIS school is going to be able to handle this transition of reentry better than a school that was heavily dependent upon uh, punitive practices such as suspension and tension. I think those schools are going to struggle. I think uh, administrators that are, we don't take crap, are going to struggle. I think administrators that are more support-minded, behavior support systems are going to do uh, much, much better. I think weak leaders are going to struggle because they're uh, they'll get trampled by outspoken uh, teachers. So if I and so I think at a county level, identifying which schools are going to need the extra support. It's like that tiered system in a classroom, and at a building level, identifying which teachers are going to struggle and addressing that because once pressure gets on the lines, that's when you'll see your leaks. So uh, th those are just some of the things I want to consider. So now, what do we do about it? Uh, what do we do about it is we start looking at these elements of strong leadership, environmental design, consistent expectations, uh, you know, strong routines, teaching, all these kinds of things. I want to unpack all these as we go. So let me start at leadership. So, you know, I always I, I believe studying pack animals is a good way to look at leadership because we know pack animals need leadership. So stuff to think about. Um, what is what is a good leader? What, one of the things we know about leadership, and this is the first line is, is stolen from uh, it's an old military saying, which is calm is contagious. And they teach them in the military that look, the leader stays calm because calm is contagious, but chaos is too. That's my add to it at the bottom. Chaos is too. So what do, how do we keep calm? What is a calm? What does a good leader look like? A good leader has two key elements that we start to unfold. And the first one is confidence. And the second one is holding frame. So confidence is I've got a good plan. And I, and I know my plan, and, I, and, and I, I truly understand what it means to execute my plan. That's what you guys have been given, what, you were, uh, what you were, uh, your county's going to be doing. Uh, I know you cut that news uh, yesterday. So now you're, you've got to figure out, now what's our plan? Uh, you're going to have county-level plans, but you're also going to have building-specific plans. You know, I, I've not spent much time in Hardy County uh, at all. In fact, I've never actually been to, uh, I've been through it, but never stopped at any of the schools there. Um, one of the things that, that I know is your schools are probably remarkably different. You probably have some that are, are similar and you probably have some that are quite different. So you're not going to have a one size fits all approach, but confidence is when you've got that plan, it's a sound plan. You've worked it out. You've tested it, uh, as best you can. And holding frame is, um, what happens when things go wrong? A good leader, a leader that melts, a leader that's anxious, a leader that's paranoid to a degree. Um, a lot of times, if they don't hold frame well, um, which means they're easily knocked off their horse, so to speak, um, they will create anxiety among their team. Uh, they will create distrust among their team because, again, the leader isn't a consistent pattern. Brain's a pattern-seeking device. If the leader's not a consistent pattern, then what they create in their folks um, it, it is anxiety because anxiety is fear of the unknown. Because if I don't know from one day to the next how this leader is going to respond, or I, this leader is so anxiety ridden that they 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 don't they aren't able to execute, um, that's really going to affect uh, the confidence of the staff. So what we're really looking at is getting those plans really strong and keeping ourselves in check from a leadership perspective because that calm is contagious and that chaos is too. Now 
But I, what I'm not saying is, is to tell everything, tell everybody it's all going to be okay. We don't know that. Nobody knows that. But acknowledging that's important is saying, listen, I don't know what's, uh, what is or isn't going to happen as far as COVID-19 goes. I don't know about spread or epidemiology or whatever it might be. But what I do know is that we're creating a plan with the information we have, with the information we have to do the best we can. And I, I've said this to, about leadership over and over again. And sometimes we have to make, we have to make decisions with the with the information we have, but not all the information we needed. And that's tough because right now we don't have all the information we needed because we didn't have we don't have all that content. So what can we do about it? If I'm a leader, I want to control controllables. First thing I'm going to start looking at is. What, and I'm just doing some therapy all the time. I do some schools all the time. Do a big T-chart. One side put can control. The other side put can't control. I'm going to start getting a list. If I meet with my staff, meet with my leadership team, whatever it might be, what are the things we have control over on the other side? What things do we not have control over? Priority one is to stop wasting energy on things we don't have control over. Can't waste my energy on um, political stuff. Can't waste my energy on um, you know what's happening in England. I can't waste my energy on that stuff because – I, we need every bit of our energy to focus on the things we do have control over. So that's a real good exercise that also shows that you're steering the ship. It also shows that you are, excuse me, you're, you're taking care of those things. So I do believe that schools will be best served to use a multi-tiered system. Everybody knows, uh, listen, I, I, I every, uh, multi-tiered system of support, West Virginia, of course, now is doing the West Virginia tiered system of support, which I'm behind 100%. Our technical assistance center is behind 100%. Um, we, we believe strongly in a multi-tiered model um, that, that so I do, like I said before, I believe schools that have been implementing school-wide PBIS are going to have a much easier time at reentry because they're going to have better, they're going to have clear expectations, they're going to be better at teaching systems, they're going to be better at feedback. Um, they're also probably going to be better at teaming, which kind of brings me into the next one, which is teaming is going to be so huge when we start talking about getting these reentry plans in place uh, because good teams solve problems and move towards solutions. Bad teams commiserate. And they actually perpetuate problems because this element, and, and I, you can debate this number. Rob Horner, uh, who I think is a brilliant person in PBIS, uh, he talked historically about behavior support plans. And one of the numbers that, that was brought up a lot of time is this idea of th- most behavior plans that you're going to do are going to have a 33% success rate on first draft. Now, what does that mean? That means your first draft is going to be probably mostly wrong. So what that tells us about teams is effective teams are teams that are good at revising plans and moving forward. So the 33 becomes 50 and the 50 becomes 70 and the 70 becomes 75. So the the difference in whether you have an effective team in your building isn't going to be, do you write the most perfect reentry plan that's ever been written and it's ready on August 1st? It's not going to be that. It's going to be how good is your team at taking the plan, the best plan you could write in August and making it better in September and making it better in October. That's good teams. Good teams know how to adjust. They know how to revise. A ba- an effective team is going to be a team when the August plan doesn't work and everybody goes, see, we shouldn't have done it this way. See, it's, it's his idea and it was their fault. Then the plan becomes a source of leverage and conflict. So really getting your team um, lined up um, and really getting those ideas is going to be essential as we move forward. So let's talk about a few different things. And I'll move kind of quickly on these. Uh, nurturing and responsive relationships, reconnecting with students, you know, looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what kids need first before we try to you know, don't burn the cake. Right. Don't get don't get the temperature too hot and move it too fast. We've got to get reconnected with our students. We've got to figure out how to make kids feel safe. And that they matter. That's just, you know, that's Maslow. Everybody's seen Maslow, but I uh, revised Maslow slightly by saying you can, not, you can narrow down his five levels to two things. Make people feel safe. And make people feel like they matter. And that's that goal. You know, looking at building our ratios, looking at things like, you know, is that John Gottman work at the University of Washington? You know, I go do observations with folks and I'll put direction correction on one side of a T-chart and a positive on another T-chart. Observe like when kids show up. And I'm looking at the ratio at arrival. I'm looking at the ratio of direction correction versus positive acknowledgement. And I went to schools and they'll have a ratio of 12 directions or corrections to every one uh, positive acknowledgement. Now, my measure of positive acknowledgement isn't anything dramatic. It's, you know, uh, hey, thumbs up, like your shirt, glad to see you. How did your game go last night? That's simple. Um, and really working on schools to get those ratios up. Middle schools and high schools tend to struggle a little bit more with this because uh, elementary has a little bit more of a nurturing spirit about it just because of the age of the kids. And middle school, high school tend to take on more of that disciplinarian 
type mindset. Uh, and not always, but it just is kind of the, the psychology. Sometimes as kids get older, as we treat them more like adults, even if they aren't. Um, so we start looking at those ratios, understanding that there will be communication challenges. This is going to be a thing that, you know, I, I think this is something you need to be talking with your staff about and when you talk with students about is saying, you know what, these masks are, you know, it's, it's strange if you got if people are going to be required to wear masks, teachers or students or both. Um, because it takes away your ability to code. It takes away some of the nonverbals. You know, I can't tell if you're smiling. Or I'm not sure if you're smiling or your voice is muffled or you're self-conscious because you get this thing on your face. Or you can't drink. You can't breathe as well. Which, what You know, I can't give you a high five. You know, those kinds of things. So though there is going to be this adjustment. I think it is important to let people process together about how are we going to display connection uh, by maintaining social distance and maintaining some level of, uh, of, of thoughtful hygiene and things like that. So an activity for, um, I think that you could do with staff and I encourage this even before COVID hit was start looking at where are relationship building opportunities, leveraging duty, leveraging opportunities of arrival, lunch, whatever that's going to look like. How are we going to make connection a priority and not just we're nice people. We love kids. It's not good enough. Just simply not good enough. Intentional. Things are important, deserve intentional practices. You pay if you're thoughtful financially, you put your bills in a certain spot, you pay them a certain time of the month because your bills are so important that they deserve an intentional practice. Same thing goes with relationships. How I can tell if the school is really serious about relationships is if they can show me a plan that they use to maximize relationship building opportunities during structured and unstructured times. And now that's going to even be more of a priority. Teaching systems. This is going to be the big one. Um, like I said, PBI schools are already very uh, acquainted with teaching systems, so it's not going to be as much of a, a much of a shift. But we're going to have to reteach kids what it's like to be at school. And the, the way you reteach is you start with what does it mean to be successful? What does it mean to be successful in a school given the COVID-19 restrictions and all this kind of stuff? That's where you start. That's, as a team, that's where you start. What does it mean to be successful? Then you build that, and then you teach that out. But you also use things like environmental design. Pre-K-12 is going to have to use environmental design in this environment. Kroger's using it. Walmart's using it. Everybody's using it. Why? Because it's, an, it, it's a neurological support to have the environment also telling you what you need to do to be successful. You know, using things like markers, separator, uh, marking, space, separation, visuals, visual cues. Uh, there's an element of this I want you to think about. You can create some of this beforehand. You can have staff help you create it, but also let students help in the creation of this. Again, it gives them a sense of ownership, gives them a sense of control. Help them, especially in your older grades, help them help you identify these ways. Organizing materials, things like that are going to be so important. Using things like visual schedules. If, if, if things are going to be disrupted, um, changing your visual schedules, going through schedules with students. People and middle school, high school folks will sometimes say, ah, that's cute for elementary or special ed, but that doesn't work. I'm telling you, I used it in, in juvenile detention facilities. I've used it in high schools. Um, I've used it with grown adults. So uh, really being thoughtful of, we have high neurological load, regulatory fatigue, visuals decrease regulatory fatigue because it gives outside support for uh, things like timing, schedules, uh, expectations and environments. Um, this word we got to get rid of. Um, kids should know how to walk down a hallway, should know how to uh, eat lunch, whatever. Assume they've forgotten it all. It's just better if you do so. Uh, the military is fantastic at this. When you arrive at boot camp, they, they assume you know nothing. They tell you how to stand, how to talk, how to walk, how to take care of your stuff because they, they don't have, they, they, they can't waste their time making assumptions about people and who should, who does know this and doesn't know that. They assume everybody doesn't know anything. So we have to be really clear about what people want. You know, I don't care if you got seniors coming in this year. Reteach hallways because the hallways are going to be different. You know what I mean? They're, they're going to be different. We're going to walk different. We're going to have different cues. Of course, I suggest three to five positive stated expectations. Um, I can't go too far into this because it's kind of the PBIS stuff and it takes a little bit longer to develop. But if you look at, for example, this is an elementary that we worked with in um, Randolph County. It's going to be easy for them to integrate their uh, COVID type strategies into their expectations, which is put safety first, uh, act respectfully, work responsibly and strive to do your best. What they're going to be able to do is plug in these COVID specific strategies into their existing teaching structure that PBIS has offered. So really simplifying and unifying. If you need some help with this, we can really help. Our technical assistance center has folks, Tiffany um, Hendershot is the uh, Eastern Panhandle Behavior Support Specialist. And we have tons of stuff I'll put in the chat box 
We have some some different. We have a, a YouTube channel. We have our website. All these things that already have some of these YouTube videos for you to watch. And you can also reach out to us for technical assistance. We can help you build this in your building. A good activity could also be looking at a setting analysis. This is also give your staff an opportunity to look at each setting, develop what those expectations might look like. Um, here's an example. This is pre-COVID of a school that we did one on a playground. And we talk about what do you want? What do you want from kids in that environment? What already works in that environment? What are inconsistencies in that environment? What are going to be the challenges in that environment? What we did is we post these all over a room. And the, this, this, um, this was an elementary, so they went around in school teams. And they went around and checked with and they wrote down on this piece of paper and then the, the administrator and the teams worked through about what the, what it looks like to, to have those. Then we're going to specifically teach in environments, rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal. Um, let's take kids. Let's let's reteach hand washing. Let's reteach structure. Let's reteach even the basic stuff like keeping our hands to ourselves in the hallway. It's not all COVID stuff. It's just how do we be successful in our building? Also modeling. You know, that's one of the best ways kids learn is by watching. So making sure that we're modeling these behaviors and how those things kind of come about. Again, lesson plan activities. When are we going? What areas are we going to teach? When are we going to teach them? I know some some counties I've talked to are doing like a staggered start, and they're going to do a lot of reteach early. Um, and some people might be bringing everybody back at once. But if you you're going to have to have, I, I'm saying it's a non-negotiable. You're going to have to have a comprehensive reteach plan, considering the dynamics, the decrease in neural load on your students. You're going to have some kids that are going to need specific group work. You might have some of your kids with special education needs. You need to get with your title people, your uh, intervention teachers, your special education teachers, kids with autism, ADHD, things like that are going to probably need extra work, extra practice. Go ahead and get ahead of that stuff because it's going to be tough um, if you're trying to do it on the fly. Last but certainly not least um, is this idea of feedback and acknowledgement. You know, if it's important enough to teach and important enough to punish, it's important enough to acknowledge. Schools that are going to struggle with acknowledgement are schools that have had large re feedback intervals, schools that have been focused on. We give feedback at the end of the nine weeks. We do uh, uh, inflatables and pizza parties and that kind of stuff. No, we're going to have to really be focused on getting those kids good feedback when they're meeting our expectations in the environment. So we, we're connecting with them and then we're reinforcing our teaching systems. So some teachers are going to need help with this. So I'm just going to need help about acknowledgement. You know, I appreciate you being safe. You know, you washed your hands well. I appreciate everybody walking safely in the hallway, stuff like that. And what that does is it closes the loop. So we teach and reinforcement closes the loop for the behavior, which then increases the likelihood that we're going to get that again in the future. And also the, the, the uh, other psychological impact of giving kids feedback when they're being successful, and this is true even pre-COVID, is it builds a level of optimism. Now, what does that mean? Optimism is not getting in your car and not buckling your seatbelt because you're an optimist. That's a, you're, it's a being an idiot. Um, you know, optimism is taking into consideration reality. The rational optimist is taking into consideration reality and taking advantage of every opportunity. So uh, the rational optimist is not a matter of just perspective, which is, is a half empty or half full. It is, where do I get more water? The rational optimist is understanding where effort equals outcome. So we want kids to start to believe, and staff, to start to believe this concept of my behavior matters. Start focusing on the idea of getting a sense of control back. Because remember in the very, very beginning, I said, hey, what's happening is anxiety is fear of the unknown. This anxiety, then they don't, and the strategies aren't working, then creates learned helplessness. So we're trying to counteract that with my behavior matters. Things that I do matter. It gives them a sense of that. And it's, I, I call it Lloyd's theory which is, if you've ever seen Dumb and Dumber, which is, if you haven't, please do so quickly. Um, it's at the end of it where he, where she tells him the chance they're going to end up together is like one in a million. It says, so you're telling me there's a chance. What all of us in our heads, I think, need as, as much as we can get right now is the belief that there's a chance that we have a little bit of control over our lives, uh, a chance that our behavior matters. Um, because we, we there's a lot of, it's tough right now. It's tough to feel empowered. It's tough to feel in control. So uh, folks need that. Uh, kids need that. Um, staff need that. Um, they're using these things to factor in and moving beyond admiring our problems to solving our problems. And, uh, you know, movement, you know, 40 percent know how, 6 percent want to. You know, the staff seeing you working hard on these things, seeing you unpacking these things and keeping that effort moving forward. Because I'm telling you, there's going to be a lot of things that aren't going to work. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to they're going to be difficult and challenging. So 
um, you know, working through the 33% towards the 50 and the 60. And telling your staff that early and telling your students that early lets them, when it happens, it makes you, it strengthens your leadership because you get to go, this is one of those things that we found that needs to be tweaked. Not, uh, remember, like I said before, it's if the plan doesn't work and you have a toxic environment, people use the failure of the plan to point towards inadequacy of the leadership. And, and, and if that's allowed, it's a symptom of other things oftentimes, but what, if that's allowed, what happens is it steals from the momentum and the collaboration and creates an us and them. Now, I fear that we're going to have a lot of that right now. There's going to be a lot of us and them. So the, the, the challenge is going to be creating plans and unifying people around plans, but unifying people around the concept that, um, that revision is how we're going to get better and understanding as the environment changes. So that was a lot of stuff really fast. And, and I don't know any other way to, to do it than, than with that level of speed, I guess. But um, this is how you track me down. This is where I'm at. Uh, my, my, you know, my email and all is on there. Also, like I mentioned before, um, I have the, uh, the I put in the, the chat box, um, the all the ATC website, the ATC YouTube page. And I also put on there the uh, YouTube pages for both as well. I also put the PowerPoint handout link in there. And like I said, we'll uh, get this recording um, uploaded and taken care of and sent to uh, Jennifer uh, pretty quickly. You may just be able to upload it online. You can access it there. So I know, uh, listen, I, I got nothing but respect for folks coming into the situation you're coming into. Being an administrator right now, there was no administrative class you took to get you ready for this uh, specifically. Um, so I'm, I, I have nothing but respect for the challenge you guys have in front of you um, to support staff in an uncertain time, but also uh, keeping in mind, we got a lot of kids that are going to have a lot of anxiety coming in and they're going to need our help and our leadership. So uh, we at the Autism Training Center and the Behavioral Mental Health Technical Assistance Center uh, look forward to helping any way we can. So I uh, appreciate everybody's time. And like I said, if you guys need me, uh, just give me a yell. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. For more information regarding the West Virginia PBIS project, you can go to www.wvpbis.org. For more information regarding the West Virginia Behavior Mental Health Technical Assistance Center, you can go to www.marshall.edu slash bmhtac. For the most current information regarding the West Virginia Department of Education's response to the COVID-19 crisis, you can go to www.wvde.us slash COVID-19. This site also has resources for families as well as educators.